I'm really digging the background. I mean, what are we what are we looking at? Uh, looks like California, is, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the um, uh, the map of the Tong Tongva villages of Los Angeles. Wow, it, I, I didn't realize that there were so many uh, Indians in California. There was like what, like tw twenty five thousand? I read in the book. In, in the we're talking about east of east here. Right, uh, right, right. In, in originally, I mean, in all of California, there were about almost three hundred ten thousand. So it was more crowded here than it was on the East Coast as far crazy. as native populations. Yeah, yeah. I mean, especially you know when when. As a, as a kid, you know, you grew up in social studies, you know, learning about how, you know, when the Europeans came here, they found this pristine land and, you know, sparsely populated villages. And then, you know, as we're, you know, as you probably can tell us, uh, as we're coming to find out that actually, no, America was on and popping, you know, and for a variety of reasons, you know, murder and, and disease, it got depopulated very quickly. Oh yeah, yeah, no, no. Um, I, I agree with with the assessment of the genocide is the term. Uh, I've uh, heard numbers uh, like ten million, twenty million people in, well, in fourteen ninety one. That book, fourteen ninety one. Right. Yeah, and then you you lose ninety percent of the population in like a hundred years. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, in California was even. I mean, California was probably in America was the was the worst example. Uh, of, or I imagine it was, it was the most accurate, no, the best example of the, of the use of uh, military and civilian power against natives because you kill 80% in about a decade, uh, right, after, right after Americans uh, conquer the West, and they conquer California. And so, uh, I mean, first of all, thank you for coming on. I mean, this was oh, sure. kind of short notice. Um, and, uh, tell, you know, introduce yourself to everybody, tell them what you do and they'll oh. get a sense of why I brought you on here. <laughs> all right. All right. I, I'll, I will need that as well. Um, my name's Dan Cady. I am a professor at Fresno state. Um, I focus on migration, uh, whiteness, Southern migration, particularly to the West, uh, African-Americans in Los Angeles. And lately, I've been slightly obsessed with uh, white nationalism and the history of white nationalism in America. Uh, I, I saw that you're working on a book. Uh, what is it called? Burning Down a Dream about b black people looking for leisure time in the 20s. I mean, that's you're, you're, you're doing deep dives there. Well, that that's yeah. Uh, what I would say to that, I probably put that project on the back, back burner for a number of reasons. Um, but I know a, there, are, there are people right now r either writing that or uh, delving into that in their own research. And so my role now is to take the information that I've dug up and to give it to other scholars uh, who are really going to put the time in to do this. And I've, I've, I've spoken to a few of them. I have uh, at least one dissertation coming out on this. Um, there have been some people in the media world that have that have shown some interest but it's it is a really great story of, of black los angeles and orange county but as i said it's not not something i can do at the moment <laughs> i mean yeah i think i think a lot of us are feeling like our hands are tied at the moment um well i think well, uh, honestly i think that it would be i think other voices may do it better well, I mean, and I I could say this because you know I'm I'm a black Latino as they say you know Afro Latino whatever you know, um, I I I don't that a whole identity politics thing bothers me when it comes to writing, because I think in in research and and and, and nonfiction, because I think that like what, what's that girl who got who got all that guff for writing that book on migration? Uh, she oh was, right, the, the she was supposed uh, to be the. Uh, uh, yes, the, the uh, you know what American, I'm talking about, right? American dirt. Yeah, American dirt. And um, fine. What if if maybe she didn't know it or she wasn't close to the material? Whatever. But like, as a writer, and that's what I consider myself a writer. I mean, you 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 have a license to write whatever you feel is interests you, even if you don't know anything. Like, can I not write about India because I don't know anything about India? Can I not write about whatever? Can I not write about Mars because I've never been to Mars? Like, that's ridiculous. 
No, I, I, I understand you. My, my, my position on this is it's actually um, has to do with the writing process for me. Mm. Uh, the, the, this, that project is the first project I'd ever worked on when I was concentrating on people who I had sympathy for. And every other thing I've ever written has been on Klansmen, uh, yeah. been on fundamentalists. And what I find in that process is, is I don't like them when I start. I don't like them when I finish, but I understand them a bit better. And, and that's the whole point, isn't it? Right. I mean, you're not supposed to like, you don't have to like the subject, but you have to right. really understand them. Right. And, and so I was finding writing that project was, was increasingly difficult because I was becoming emotionally attached to the, to the people, uh, that, and I, I, I don't know if I felt compromised or just uncomfortable, but it, it's still a great story and I would love to see someone do it. But, I mean, it, 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 what did you say as a, as an academic, as a researcher, that it's better to come to a subject, not liking the person because you're could be critical, but like you're saying, if if you are coming to the subject sympathetic, then you're you know less likely to dig up dirt or be critical and give us a fuller picture of that person. Is that the concern there? It, it, it is. It is for me. I think a lot of people can can do that, and they're they're that talented. Uh, I'm not one who can. In fact, I really can't find my voice unless it's slightly snarky. <laughs> I, I've been finding that too, you know, and I've been trying to get away from that, but it's, uh, you know, I think for a lot of us, r rage is a fuel for writing and research, right? Like, let me figure this out so I can d demolish it, you know? Right. Yeah. No, it, it, it is about myth busting, myth busting, myth busting. Right. And uh, as, uh, just even thinking about that project, I immediately get sucked back into this vortex of, oh, it's so important. This is such a great story that no one's ever heard. Um, yeah, there actually, it's been, it's been, there's been some, but not <laughs> enough, just not enough. So let me let me tell you how you got here on this show. Uh, okay. Again, thank thank you for coming on, um, Romeo, Mr. Guzman, who I, mm -hmm. I haven't met personally, but. He's a friend of a friend, a friend of a guest, a past guest, uh, Luis Marentes, who is, uh, I believe, the director of the Spanish and Portuguese department at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. And he came on the show and then uh, directed me to, to Romeo in this book, uh, East of East, The Making of Greater El Monte. Um, and I hadn't, you know, I've been to L.A. a bunch of times. I never I didn't even know about El Monte. And uh, so I'm reading, you know, at first I thought it was a straight history book. But it's you know it comes with a variety of uh, different uh, essays, historical essays. You wrote one, and uh, Romeo's like, "Well, I can't come on the show because I'm for you know I'm busy with yada yada." But or I I, I don't feel comfortable. I don't know if he felt didn't feel comfortable coming on because uh, he seemed to think that oh, as an editor maybe I would want as an editor he should suggest somebody who actually wrote something a piece right. And uh, he goes, uh, what about, what about D Dan, Caddy, Caddy? Is it Katie. Katie, sorry. That's, that's quite all right. People say Alamo to me. Oh, uh, I am. <laughs> I am sure that your last name has been butchered everywhere but and Texas. And I'm like, and it's happened to me in Texas. And I'm like, <laughs> really? Anyways. Um, and he goes, well, you know, you should have uh, Dan, Katie. Katie. On, and, um, you know, he wrote the, he wrote about the, El Monte boys and the neo Nazis and all that, and uh, I'm like, all right, it's a little, it's a little on the nose, but okay. And uh, but then, you know, we were gonna have a great conversation, anyways. But then uh, Tuesday, I'm sure you saw the debate. Um, I did not. Oh, you did not. I, I wasn't not. going to because I'm sick of politics, and my wife was like, she's such a country. Whatever I want to do, she doesn't want to. She wants to do the opposite. So now I'm like, okay, you know, let's not watch the debate because I'm always trying to force her to watch the debate. So I'm like, let's not watch the debate. She's like, what do you mean? I want to see the debate. I'm like, fuck, okay. Uh, you know, and I was reading. I was having a nice time. So we watched the debate. It was a fucking shit show. Um, it was the, you know, I'm, that's, this is not uh, hyperbole. It was the worst debate. It was in American history. It was sad. Well, I'm sure I've heard there's some crazy debates in the 1800s, right? Uh, where people said some wild shit in a, in a debate or speaking from a platform. Right, right. 
to, to audiences of 50 to a couple hundred people. Right. Well, yeah. <laughs> instead, of, instead of our 50 million. Uh, yes, yeah, well, they say something of the, the the election of nineteen twenty eight or eighteen twenty eight between John Quincy Adams and and Andrew Jackson, right? Where you know your wife's your wife's a whore. Well, you're a jackass. <laughs> you know, like okay, uh, a, but you're anyway, a, you're a, your wife's a whore and you're a pimp. Yeah, no, yeah, there you go. For Russian uh, prostitutes, so you know there are some themes that apparently uh, make their way back into the political discourse. Well, yeah, I mean that, that, that's our pure <laughs> puritanical founding, isn't it? Um, but it, it was it was shocking, and people were you know Van Jones made a point on this on CNN afterward, like we shouldn't be shocked, but it was shocking that he you know Trump given you know uh, I was going to say Mike Wallace, what's his name? Uh, Mr. Wallace is called Chris, yeah, Chris Wallace. Chris Mike's- Wallace. Mike's kid, right? Yeah, Mike's kid, Mikey's boy. Um, <laughs> he gives him a, you know, the perfect platform. Will you condemn white supremacy? Softball. Softball, right? <laughs> Here you go. Racism bad, you know. Take the biggest swing you can, and he just, uh, 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 yeah, uh, you know, whatever. Did he say stand by? What did he mean by stand by? I don't know, but it sound sounds iffy, right? And the Proud Boys. From what I see on what I hear on social media and stuff like that, they took it as encouragement. Oh yeah, I'm sure that their their hands are all swollen from high fiving each other for right. the last uh, 48 hours. And then so and you know those two things clicked in my head. Okay, you wrote about the El Monte Boys, and here's this group calling themselves the Proud Boys, and from what I can tell from what you wrote about them, El Monte Boys, they're kind of the same vibe, right? They I mean, I think the Proud Boys are a little bit more um, organized, um, but they're, I mean, explain what the El Monte Boys were in the Los Angeles area. Well, well, the Monte Boys, um, I think that someone else did the, did the work on, not think, someone else in this book did the work on the Monte Boys, though I have written, uh, I have, I've written on them to, to a degree. Um, very limited degree, but they were essentially vigilantes, white vigilantes uh, in El Monte uh, in the mid to late 19th century. And they, f- like like the vigilante squads in Los Angeles and San Francisco, they found themselves to uh, be filling those gaps where there was no law. Mm. At least this is in their, their mind's eye. And they tend to control control non their 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 notion is to control land and non-whites so you do this by murder and there are no repercussions and this is true of uh, vigilantes uh, across uh, across california i was gonna well i was gonna cross america right i mean isn't that how the texas rangers got their start right patrolling indians right the right border. right yeah i mean and the rangers the rangers actually get uniforms after a while right uh these these guys <laughs> these guys yeah like rage against the machine um <laughs> would say that um some of those enforces uh, are the same <laughs> process right that they may wear two uniforms yeah uh in as it as it gets further on but but certainly Certainly by the 1920s, uh, with the rise of the Klan in Southern California in El Monte, you do have a good deal of overlap between the police departments and the Klan. We'll talk about, you know, um, the, the Klan's resurgence, in the, especially the early 20s. I mean, was that because the old, I mean, I guess it was new then, but, you know, white men went to, went to war and black men took those jobs and when the white men came back they wanted their jobs back and they saw it as black people taking over i mean you explain it well there's the the history of the clan in the 1920s really begins in about uh 1915 where you you have two things happen there is a methodist preacher a uh, very powerful uh, very popular, has a big church in New York, but he's really a South Carolina guy, North South Carolina guy named Thomas Dixon. And Thomas Dixon, uh, who is roommates with Woodrow Wilson at Johns Hopkins, uh, Thomas Dixon writes a series of books uh, about the Klan during Reconstruction. And they're they're extremely popular in the South. They're somewhat popular in the North, but 
one person who loved them uh, decided to make the movie about Birth of a Nation. Right. So Birth of a Nation is this comes out in 1915, 1916, can't really remember. Uh, and it portrays the clan as these, they really are knights. They are virtuous. It's about chivalry. Uh, it's about tradition. And then there is this corruption that they're fighting. Yeah. And I remember seeing it in, in college, you know, I took a African, you know, African Americans in film class. And, you know, there's that scene where they show the black uh, people in Congress, you know, taking off their shoes and socks and picking their feet and drinking, yes. you know, right there in Congress. You know? Yes. Yes. So this, yeah. Right. So, yeah, that's. The, but that's it's, everybody's in, there's no black people in the movie, let's say. It's all, everybody in white face, uh, black face. That's, a, that's actually another interesting story. There are a number of African-Americans in the movie. <sighs> um, of course there are. <laughs> because, because this was all of that, that set was mostly down you know where uh the scientology center is oh wait yeah. no you're not from los angeles well no i've been there i've, I've seen the okay, big right, blue building right. you go by near the Sci scientology center if you kept if you kept following east for a while that was close to uh your plantations and those sets uh when the clan is oh i read is, that in the book too i read that in the book too. yeah everything everything is the in los angeles and black actors like this is the first time that they've really had an in uh, for a major movie, yeah. and so they they cast a, a a large number of black actors, and I mean this this itself becomes controversial because on the heels of this you have you know, Amos and Andy, you have uh, King Fit, you have these other ca stock characters, uh, but with Afri African Americans as leads, and that are entirely racist, you know, Cabin in the Sky and these sorts of movies, um, but. But yeah, the lead roles are most definitely the grotesque blackface, and so with the with that, there is another. The next character is this guy named uh, uh, oh, my, Wow, my my brain today. Uh, Joseph <laughs> it's Friday, it's Joseph Friday. Patrick Simmons, <laughs> and he is one of these guys. He's a member of the Elks Lodge. He's in the Masons. He's in the you know the the fraternity of the you know the buffalo whatever water buffalo another like upstanding a, like, citizen yeah yeah like Fred Flintstone <laughs> and he is sick in a hospital and starts reading ads for Birth of a Nation uh, that's going to be playing and he thinks to himself you know what this idea of the clan it's too bad it went away it should really come back again and so he on his own starts launching this thing. And by just about the just about the end of the First World War, he essentially partners with a New York uh, advertising firm. And between them, this advertising firm and and Patrick Simmons, they they're they're able to go across the country just selling this stuff. Uh, but the way they sell it is this: they don't sell it as race and they don't sell it as anti-black at all. What they do is they say, look, all the Klan is is a Christian patriotic organization. And all we want are Christian patriotic men. And like a lot of fraternal orders, we only accept white men. Then that is not unusual for anyone. Now, when you get into the literature, it is clearly more racist. It rarely goes like off the rails. Most of it is all wrapped in the glory of, of the virtuous South and men being men and protecting women. And there's a lot of fear of, of, of booze. Yeah. People, people drinking and Catholics and Jews. Those get mentioned. African-Americans, I always had the sense that one of the reasons why it there's a limited amount of, of even discussion about Black America is that the Klan pretty much felt that they'd won that battle. Uh, Jim Crow was law. If they looked east, Jim Crow was law. And if they looked in Los Angeles, it was de facto law. And so this wasn't as much on their minds. And so the, so the people who joined the Klan in the early 20s, 
are not really responding to blackness as they're responding to otherness, to a basic foreign ideology that's creeping up on them. Uh, and, and so in today's world, it would be more like these immigrant debates mm. that are, because this is what we hear, let me, what the, the subtext always is, our culture's changing. Yeah. Uh, there's it's too fast. They're bringing foreign ideas and, you know, them, those, they're bringing this religion. They're, uh, they have a different language. They, yeah. Can you believe they have different words for the same <laughs> things we already have? Yeah. Like cup, go figure. Well, no, <laughs> well, I, not even that. I mean, I, I live in Vegas. I just moved here about four years ago. And I'm, you know, I, I, the first thing I heard was that it's not pronounced Nevada. It's pronounced Nevada. And I'm like, no, it actually is pronounced Nevada. <laughs> in the original Spanish, it's Nevada, you know? And so it's, anyway, that's just a side note that, you know, there's, you look at California, Colorado, these are all Spanish words, but if you pronounce them Spanish, then you're, then you're other, then you're foreign. We got Los Angeles. Yeah. I mean, I grew up in LA and it is, for me, it was Los Angeles. And all the uh, street but- names and everywhere. It's like, it's crazy. How can you be racist where everything's named after, has a Spanish name? The, the the craziest one is in San Francisco. In okay. San Francisco, the uh, in uh, which streets are those? There is Cabrillo, Arguello, and Junipero Serra. And those are those are three main streets in the city. And that is the way everyone pronounces it. And uh, that's something I've never discovered. At what point in time? Did they determine that that was going to be the correct pronunciation? Because it's not even trying. Yeah, yeah, it's, that's that's a good point. It's not even trying, right? And so, I mean, that's the whole thing, right? I mean, the Proud Boys now they they talk about just being and racist in general, and they won't they wouldn't call again. They don't call themselves racist, right? They just they don't even call themselves white supremacists. They just say, "I'm proud of being white. I'm proud of my white culture of being Christian of." of country music and na- apple pie and NASCAR and yada, yada, yada of, you know, the heroes of the, of the revolution, the heroes of the civil war. And so, and they, and they point to Latinos and they point to black people and they point to everybody else in this country who does the same thing with their culture. But it's, everybody gets on edge when you, when white people start talking about white pride, pride in white culture. As, as they should, <laughs> if you talk if, whiteness is, is first i mean first of all you know, race in america you can't throw a penny into the air and not hit something about race in america as i was going to ask you that I, I, I thought i was before I, you i've been thinking about this for days i was going to ask you that are we ever going to get rid of that is, is there ever going to be an america without racism i mean i'm starting to believe no because there have, there have been great people who have come before us and articulated the issues perfectly and America not only doesn't get it, but refuses to get it. Well, it's it. It comes back to this like 1776 project, and what every every college student in a decent history class says: "Wow, I had no idea that that really was our history. Like, how come I wasn't taught this before?" And I, you know, we know that you weren't taught this. We wouldn't have to be doing this if this were taught correctly the first time, if right. we were honest the first time around, if we didn't build all of our history on myth. I mean, the, the greatest scam in, in California is the missions and the mission project that every California kid used to have to do. And everyone who does it and all of the teachers believe that there really was this you know, noble young priest who was able to build these missions and help out these natives. Uh, Junipero Serra was, was the father of California. But in reality, in the 1880s, no one had heard of Junipero Serra. The Americans had come in and they had destroyed the missions. They used them for building blocks for their own, for corrals and lean-tos, whatever they needed. There would, you would find more pigs Goats, pigs, gamblers, and prostitutes in missions than you would find priests. <laughs> no doubt. No, no two ways about it. And then when somebody writes a book about, about you know, Hacienda living, 
And it, it, in this really well-timed, well-intentioned book, uh, Ramona, which was intended to shed light on the mistreatment of natives, but instead, all the white people from the Midwest are like, oh, that sounds, read this page. <laughs> oh, that sounds so gorgeous. Listen to the way that they ride horses. Oh, the, Ooh, honey, then, let's stay in a hacienda next summer. <laughs> exactly. Like so, yeah, the Mission Inn, right? Uh, that, oh, ado, adobe. That is going to be so nice, right? And so they reconstruct this mission myth. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah, we've got to have a hero. So they essentially make Junipero Serra out of dirt. And they make plays about him and their pageants. There's all sorts of wild stuff. But it becomes the reality of curriculum. I mean, that that's what the mission project is based on, not on the actual missions. It's yeah. on this relaunching of this mission fantasy. And so every kid in California, and Junipero Serra, he, he's this icon for, for the state. And it's it is kind of like having Peter Pan. I mean, it's not particularly real. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's crazy. More of a syndrome. Than I mean, in this, reality. when you're do the res, when they're not only resurrecting him, but they're creating this myth around him. I mean, this is the same time that you know Confederate statues are going up everywhere, as if they'd been there all along, right? Right. Uh, this is a, this is exactly that time, and. Uh, Oddly enough, the same people who are pushing Junipero Serra, uh, this is back to fraternal organizations. It, you have the native sons, uh, of native sons and daughters of native sons of the Golden West that have the exact same criteria to join this, this, this uh, fraternal group as the clan. The only difference is you have to be born in California to join the group, but you have to be a white man. And, and it's called the, of the of the native West, it's a, the, the but native, no natives, right? <laughs> the, 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 the native sons of the golden West. And they still exist. There, there are a few of them. They used to be a extremely powerful entity. Uh, they, they were mostly responsible for the passing of uh, alien land acts to keep the Japanese uh, from owning land uh, that this was, and putting up statues. Statues of Pioneers, as right. you see in the books. And then you then you have the uh, United Daughters of the Confederacy, right. who are in California as well. And they, I mean, they put up their statues. There's one in um, Hollywood Cemetery. We've got, we've got at least a plaque up here in the Central Valley to an old Confederate. Uh, they had a Confederate old age home in Los Angeles. The and wasn't, wasn't ran, California, didn't Lincoln, or was it Lincoln? Who, who rushed California's statehood? Well, to, California, California rushed its own statehood, yeah. uh, but yeah, it, I mean, it comes in. It comes in as a free state, it, it, for what that's worth. Right. <laughs> um, free, free is not the right word, but just just the uh, the terms, uh, and and it it uh, Mike, I gotta have some coffee. <laughs> Cheers. Me too. Uh, California is part of the Union, but that's the other. That is the other uh, part where the Monty Boys come in. Uh, Southern California is was most definitely Confederate uh, sympathizers. And it, is that just because the whole? I mean, just from the the Mason Dixon line straight south. I mean, that's why they wanted to take. That's why the United States wanted to take over. The Confederacy wanted to take over Mexico, right, to spread slavery through Mexico. Yeah, no, it certainly tried. Uh, it certainly tried <laughs> in Texas earlier. Yeah, um, and yeah, the Confederate. No, yeah, sure. The Confederacy saw the end of slavery being at the being somewhere, somewhere uh, in South America. <laughs> that they would that that essentially. I mean, this uh, as the ideology. And they haven't gotten too far from that, if you think about it. But anyways. no, no, they haven't. <laughs> but the, the, the difference is now. The, the interesting difference now is. In the 19th century, uh, these sorts of white Americans, uh, filibusters is what they were, or filibusterers. That guy and, who went into Nicaragua, what's his name? Right, right. From Kentucky. I can't remember yeah, yeah, yeah. Two yeah. J's, right? He has two J's or something? Yeah, like I can't remember. This is this is the great thing about history. I can never remember dates or names. Yeah, I'm the uh, same so. way. I'm the same way. I remember the story, but I don't remember dates and names. <laughs> but they believe that, that cultures would just sort of melt away in the face of whiteness. And this was the dominant ideology 
up until about 1890. Because well, then, and, and in the late 1800s, then you start getting into social Darwinism, and then it's like, which 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 was supporting exactly what they thought, and the intellectuals of that time, uh, the you know the kind of racial scientists who really really embraced the term racist. Yeah, like they thought that would be like geologist at some point in time. <laughs> they really did. I'm a racist. I have a PhD in racism. Uh, yeah, no, they, re- <laughs> they they really would. If right. if that continued, you could have gotten a PhD in racism. It would be the, the history of the evolution of the races. Uh, and part of that ideology was up until like, yeah, about 1890 was that non-white people would certainly melt, just melt away. When whites showed up, they'd be like, you know what? We had our time here, but it's time to, we know our superiors when we see them, let's just go. Right. And this, they really, and this is the way that they had written the history of the American West. This is where they'd written the history of America. They'd written the history of the 13 colonies over and over and over again. Uh, they were essentially Englishmen uh, with German blood who uh, who were able to face off against all these people, and they hardly even needed to fire a shot. Yeah. And so the idea for the, the South was, yeah, all we have to do is keep pushing further south, and those people just run. Yeah. And we'll run. They'll run until they run into the ocean. Yeah, and I mean, we'll and just that, do that. And that's continued, right? That's that was a mistake in Vietnam. That's a mistake in you know Iraq. You know that right? But that, that the but the twist comes with immigration around the turn of the century. Now all of a sudden you're getting these Eastern Europeans. They look. I mean, their skin is white, but they <laughs> ain't white. Yeah. Uh, there's something wrong here. You're getting Catholic Italians. You're getting the the. the Greeks, so many people that are so wrong because they're so foreign. Yeah. And then the ideology shifts saying, wait, there is one way that white people can lose. And that's if they get bred out of existence. Mm. And so if you accept these people into your homes, if you accept these people into your families, you are essentially committing race suicide slowly. And it only takes one person to take a family line and make them into that other thing. Right, because then you're and with, with that word octoroon, whatever. Yeah, you know? your quadroons, your <laughs> octoroon. The, the obsession with the drops of blood in America is wild. Which is hilarious that you know we're an, we're an African species, if you think about it. We are an African species. We just conquered the globe. And the fact that no, you know, now we're now there's this huge effort, especially in this country, but in the white world, to eradicate the the people of Africa and their descendants is so I so tragic. I was gonna say ironic, but it's tragic. Well, I, I, it, their their rhetoric almost is always we are not racist, right? And you can have your territory, right? And we're gonna have ours. Do not come into my yard. Yeah. <laughs> and, but, and that's only because I love my people. Yeah. And you love your people too. Right. But that whole your people, my people, that's that's also the other fallacy, right? Your people, my people. Like what what's the division there? It's some an imaginary, it's an imaginary line, like the you know, the the border or something. Now we have border between peoples. And the the, the thing I wanted to bring up is that that whole so- social Darwinism is with us, and for the very reason that people look around and they say, and I know I know Latinos, I, I know liberal Latinos, who you know when I met them they thought, oh, look 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 how black people live, they live in ghettos. Why if why don't they just move, you know? And they really thought that they they there's people who look at the world that is what I mean to say. There's people who look at the world and they think, oh, this must be because of natural differences between races, not knowing politics not knowing economics not knowing policy right and i and i knew that as a kid i grew up in a very uh racially diverse but divided segregated suburb of chicago and we lived in you know uh the latinos and black people and and eastern european immigrants lived on the poor side of town and all the established white families lived in the houses on the other side of town and I always had a strong sense of my own worth, right? I knew I was smart. I knew I had good qualities. And so when I saw this, I was like, why is that? I know 
And I knew people, Latinos and black people, who were just as good as white people on the other side of town. So then I knew that it wasn't a race, like it had nothing to do with race, that, oh, somebody set it up like this. And that got me into history, like in high school. Because I'm like, this is, this is a story. Somebody set it up like this. This is a natural. But a lot of people don't look at it like that, right? They see these are natural differences. It's obvious, right? Black people live in ghettos. Look at the black unemployment rate. Look at the black uh, college graduation rate. Obviously, they're inferior. Not seeing, not going further with that. Well, and I think this is exactly exactly it because there seems something something seems authentic about it to people. Like this must be this, especially way because... when you want to when you're white, so you want to believe it. Oh, oh yeah, oh yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, but then you see you see that bleeding into to those very communities, um, yeah. and and you get your uh, Her- Herman Cain's. And the characters like this, like, you know, I, I actually got my shit together. Why don't you guys? Right. And it is a completely and utterly ahistorical. But on for white people, there there is a really strong logic of why this natural order exists. Okay, what I would say is, yeah, I watched the NBA Finals. There, most of the people on the court are black. This means that black people are much better at that sport. And they're more athletic, they're more this, they're more that. Um, I, you know, look in these these places where the, where this group really thrives. Right. And so there are these natural differences. So why is it so taboo for me to say that if there are physical differences, why wouldn't there be even in slight measures intellectual differences? That's the whole bell curve controversy, right? Right, right. So this is the bell curve bullshit, yeah. And so it, it, it again, com- Utterly out of context, ahistorical nonsense, but it feels right. Yeah, feels right, it, right? <laughs> it's anic- I mean, what Stephen Colbert is, invented, what George Bush tr- invented, it feels right. You know, it's right. the truthiness it's tr- of it. Truthiness, yes. And and I, it, as a as as a white dude who grew up in a you know suburban LA, mostly white community. Uh, not entirely, but but dominantly white. That you're inculcated with this at all times. It it just seems the natural order in the same way that you the you, the religion you're raised with. Like, of course, Jesus is watching me right, right now. You right. Know? And I, I couldn't even question that because that's that is so much a part of a part of my identity. No right. one ever sat me down and said, "Hey, kid, white people are better." I just want you to know that. All right, and here are all the reasons why. He didn't need that. I had history lessons, and I listened to my grandpa's stories, and I did. You know, we had neighbors, and then you know the different Jesus, the differences in our neighbors. If like one kid parted his hair on the the wrong <laughs> side, it was like, dude, you're a freak. I don't want you hanging out with that boy. <laughs> yeah, and and so then add racial differences to this. Yeah, and it was and racism was was just so casual. It's yeah. just what you said. Yeah, and, and the same same thing with I, I will always remember that at school we played this game uh, where it was like tag, but it was more like rugby, that whoever was it was gang tackled, and so they had to run, and everyone would chase them, and it was called smear the queer. I was just gonna I was just gonna bring that up. Yeah, we used to play it on a slide. Yeah, smear the queer. The queer and like, like I didn't even think about it. Like, we, I was it, probably playing with gay kids, right? Like gay kids were probably playing that with us because everybody, everybody in the neighborhood was playing it. Right. And and nobody's like, you know what? That's like, I didn't even know what the queer was. We just knew the queer was, okay, it was like this, the, the whatever it is in Harry Potter, that little gold ball with wings that right, they right. play. The, 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 snit, or the snitch or the sn- whatever it's called. The snitch, yeah. yeah. The snitch, what does it mean? It's yeah. just this word, right? It's really <laughs> queer. What does it mean? It's just this word. Yeah, right? But that that's the innocence of childhood, right? We didn't even think what it, that queer was a person or anything. It was just... It didn't mean anything. It just meant it was the name of the game. Right. And then as it gets mature context, right. you have that natural homophobia there. You're like, oh, that's wow. why we did that. This makes it. And, and, and this is this wow. is why, again, I mean, I think that most people go through this almost epiphany in college if they're really paying attention. Yeah. Because 
unless you're raised by Black Panthers, unless you're raised by radicals, you know, you're, you're constantly just getting by in a mundane world of, yeah, you may be bitter, bitter and frust frustrated, but you kind of accept your lot. And it seems natural. Then you go to college and you find out that there's nothing natural about this and it didn't have to be this way. Yeah. And, and then, and now you get these motherfuckers, right? Like Trump, who like, you know what? We cannot teach people that anymore. Yeah. <laughs> that, is, that is making them restless. Well, isn't it that the, you know, school textbooks across the country have to, are in a de facto way approved by the Texas Board of Education because Texas buys more textbooks than anybody. So the textbook companies are catering to Texas. <laughs> Imagine yeah. that. For profit margin, and there's no educators on the Board of Education. <laughs> the, the, I don't know what it's like now, but it was about 10 years ago, the head of the Board of Education was a right-wing uh, fundamentalist uh, orthodontist. Oof. Like, what, what did this guy do to get on the, get on the, board of the school board, Board of yeah. Education, any of these things? So, I mean, to, to go back to my question of will this ever end, you're, you're, you seem to think, and I, that's the hope, the sliver of hope that I, you know, I indulge myself in believing sometimes when I'm being kind to myself that if we can just get to kids, if we can just set up an education system that teaches uh, tolerance, teaches uh, understanding of other people, that we can create a society where racism is... If not eradicated, then it's just not even a, a, a an issue. It's so minor. Well, yeah. Well, I mean, in order cultural perse perseverance and perseverance, but perseverance, cultural perseverance is important. I know what do you mean you, by cultural perseverance? You you have the right. One has the right to uh, to believe that an egg going across your body from your grandmother is going mm. to cure the cold. Yeah. You have that right. And yes, I, in my mind, I don't think it's going to work, but I also think that that's something I never want you to lose. Freedom of thought. Yeah, I want your grandkids and great grandkids to be able to have that egg and able to have those recipes and able to have those things that, that you know, show your lineage that, that give you a confident identity. Well, then let me take it further because I've said this in my more wild times, like, that there's a, and I kind of, I still believe it, right? You have a right to have racist beliefs. You just don't have a right to act on them. Well, what, what, what I would, what I'm thinking is you have the right to all of those things, but I kind of agree in a large way with, on principle, with the white racists. And I know this is that sounds, that sounds <laughs> cut, like, cut. <laughs> yeah, in principle, that the way that this, the way that we move through the idea of race as being so such a fundamental problem, yeah, is through is through having kids and having kids with people of with other races. Yeah, they see and the writing on the wall. I mean, they're not and, crazy. They they see the writing right, on the wall. It's why they're trying to. Right, and and you you gain. Yeah, sure, you lose, but you you gain as well. It, it's essentially. That sort of generational difference is it's exactly like when you move from apartment to apartment or whatever to whatever. Every My time you move, yeah. you've got this, okay, what am I going to bring with, with, with me and what am I casting off? What do I keep and what do I throw away? And you, it, and you, you see that, you've moved from here to there to there to there. How many times have you been sitting with those boxes with two things in your hand like, oh, this is kind of heavy, but it's kind of important and and Do after I a while, really you just this? stop placing importance in anything, right? If you move enough, you're like, oh, I'm just the same person. I've lost all my stuff. I'm the same person. Right. And, and every, I think every generation with, with, I don't know, the true integration of cultures, these sort of real hybrids that we will have, like that this is not necessarily the answer to racism, but it sure changes a lot when your redneck has to look down at his his or her grandbaby and recognize that that kid's brown. Yeah. And now it's personal. Now it's right there. 
Well, it's not and even then, that. I mean, you could have a pure white grandbaby, but their heroes, you know, they're, they're listening to rap music. Their heroes are LeBron James and the people in that, you know, black athletes. And, you know, they probably love Obama. Like, all their heroes are black, you know, and that that's cutting into what you think is your culture, too. Now your grandbabies don't have your culture. Oh, right, right. And, and there are some things that simply are culturally inappropriate as time goes by. Yeah. And... And that's something that we cast off. White people have to recognize and will recognize that they themselves are mutts. They themselves are what the Klan calls mud people. They themselves are this mixture of all these things that never should have been in other cultures and are now. And families and interracial, interethnic families are not dangerous they are in fact the future i mean and that's what fact, it is right it's a fear of the future right i mean like you're saying it's sad to lose you know maybe america one day won't be a place of apple pie and you know church services and stuff like that but okay it, it'll be something else right that day's, that day's now yeah i was gonna say I mean, that day is let's now. not anger them too much you know not right before an election but uh yeah you're right you're right i mean but, but it's not a threat Right. It, this is this is pluralism. This is what was envisioned to a degree that with the best principles, the best ideas of these founders. That's what we should, if we're going to say this Constitution's worth anything. Yeah. Which right now it is being essentially destroyed by the very people who say they're protecting it. Yeah. Um, it's like child abuse. I'm beating you because I love you. Uh, that. If that's the case, I mean, it is our shared humanity. Yeah. And and it is our pluralism. It is the fact that we are of, of, of many and we become this one thing. Why don't we focus on that? Yeah. And we're going to have to, or we're going to have to fight. And that's what that's what that's what Dr. King said, right? All we're asking is that we that America live up to what it says it is on paper. That's all. Everybody's born equal, you know. Uh Plur, e pluribus unum, you know, isn't aren't those great ideas? Don't you guys worship that stuff? And about about white people preserving their culture and their race, I mean, let's you you could same was true of uh, Malcolm X in the beginning. Same was I've heard Ma Muhammad Ali say the same thing, right? Don't you? I love my black skin. Don't you love your white skin? I want my babies. I want my wife to be black. I I don't want to I don't want to eradicate my skin, right? I mean, so it's a it it's a disease, you know, it's a disease of of human nature, right? To, to have that tribalism, to have that, oh, these people look like me, so I have to stick together. And it, and it just so happens that white people are in power and just so happens is a, is a loose term, but there are, <laughs> they're in power. So they're, you know, we're being suffered. We're suffering under their racism, but I tell my Latino friends and I tell my black friends all the time, do you think it'd be any different if black people were in power? It had been in power for a thousand years, two thousand years, or if Latinos were different, I mean, we're in power. It's 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 that thing that we need to get rid of. That my people, your people, mine, yours. Well, it, and it's we're we're a simplistic lot as a as yeah. a human race. Yeah. But, you know, it, and it does it does bring me back to to uh, Romeo's book, uh, what what he asked me to do, and I was I was just. I always, I think I spend more time on titles than I do on the actual writing. And when I was thinking about white power and the goofiness of these, of the episodes in El Monte, it just <laughs> kept going over rise, fall, repeat. Yeah, that's just what they do. They rise, fall, and repeat. Uh, they, they show up, they make a big proud boy moment, they march in or drive in with their trucks. Uh, we haven't seen them in 10 years, maybe 20 years, and here they are again, and they're pretending like this is all new, and uh, some people be sympathetic, but sure as shit, they are going to run themselves into the ground. They, they start fighting with do. each other. That's the yes. most fun. And of course they, they, they would. Of course they would, right? That's their whole MO. They don't, they can't get along, not even with them, each other. That's their whole thing. They can't get along. No, this is all gangs. This yeah. is from the mafia to the IRA to the kids on the corner. Cartels, whatever. right, yeah. Yeah, they are going to turn on each other. The Proud Boys are going to turn on each other uh, if, if they keep going 
I mean, they're going to go in some some form. They go underground. They're like the 17 year cicadas, right? Because it's a pride. Like, <laughs> yeah, 17, I, I know about those in Chicago, but um, yeah, it's a pride thing, right? I mean, it's the pride. Like, if you're, you're if you're prideful, you're going to start turning on the people that you shouldn't be turning on. You know, for your own good, your pride gets in your way. Well, you have this excess existential fear that that your existence is threatened, and so first you you you, you know. It's like a, a Lord of the Rings. What would be the uh, what would be the the Battle of Helm's Deep? So there's my white nerdy guy. Uh, so that's my Battle favorite. That's Deep my favorite or, one. That's two, right? The the the, the two yeah, towers. Yeah, and, and so absolutely my favorite. My favorite scene is this battle, and you keep falling back, fall back to this one, fall back to the wall, fall back to the keep, fall back to this, right? And so the creation of these white white identity groups is okay. Here come the hordes, right? Everyone fight. Uh oh, they're coming further. Fall back. So now our first fallback is all white people. Our next fallback is there are too many white traders here, so we're going to have just white Christian people. And then we'll fall back again. We're going to only have white Christian armed Republicans. Yeah. And, and then sooner or later, they're going to be falling back beyond their own people that there exist now. Right. They're going to say, like, you know, Jimmy, I used to love you like a brother, but you're, since you're not actually my brother, I'm falling back to my family unit. Yeah. So you're out. I mean, and you see that clearly with Hitler, right? I mean, he wanted to conquer the world. He wanted the Aryan race to conquer the world. He dies with a bullet in his brain in a bunker in Berlin, you know, right back. That You couldn't get more. You couldn't fall back more than that, right? Yeah. And his problem was he believed in the too much in the American model. Yeah. He talk thought, about that. I mean, this is a good segue to talk about what happens. You know, the KKK rises up in the 20s. They That's probably their peak, right? The KKK in America. The 20s. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're, this is when they're marching down. Uh, with, Washington D.C., right? Yes, yes. But now they'd be marching down uh, Black Lives Matter Boulevard, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which, which I would, that would be a that's a poster. The yeah, Klan, there's, there's a, the, the showing of the birth of this nation screening in, in the White House. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But all that stuff. But then, lightning. then it turns into the American boom in in the, in the American Nazism in the 30s. So what is what is that? Is it is it like? that the KKK had a loose ideology and then here comes the Nazis from Germany saying, oh, oh that actually could work for us. Well, well, th- what I would, what I think here is that there's this overlap with Europeans. There's an overlap in England. There's an overlap, less so as far as I understand, in France, but there's certainly an overlap in Germany. Germany being essentially a, a fairly new state, like yeah. nation state. Yeah. And creating its identity, you know, <laughs> it's it's great. You want to know about German, to know German identity of the 19th century, the best place to go is Disneyland. And <laughs> Epcot and, Center? Or no, 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 no. Go to Fantasyland. And all these little German fairy tales with these white princesses. Uh, I mean, and they're, you know, these are the Grimm's fairy tales. These, 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 these white people. Uh, and what makes the Germans strong, they have this folk culture that's so important. And, and so you have these, these developing folk cultures across Germany and the United States that there's some patigo there. And I love that. Germans, yeah. Germans are fascinated with the American West. Like Hitler was loved it. This cowboys and Indians stuff, uh, the, you know, pioneers marching across the country. This was, it was insane for them. They loved this idea that, wow, this is almost like our past. Germans, what we were raised in these forests. Right. Oh, right. So many years ago. That's how we forged our identity. And now we're watching as people who, the, the offspring of those people who went through England, who went here, they get their forest now. And they're doing exactly what we did. And whoever was in front of them gets mowed down or gets out of the way. Right. And so, the Germans love this model. This is great. German painters come over to the United States just to paint uh, landscapes, but just to do these great Western Western portraits. And and so by the early 20th century, there's a lot of shared beliefs about about race and the and, destiny of a, of a certain race and and, and a sh- and a shared a shared destiny with Europe. And um, this is why there is conflict about going to the conflict about going to war with Germany to, uh, and I'm, I'm sure war historians will lose their shit. Uh, <laughs> it, it's, 
yes, it's about who are you allied with? We feel more English than this and that and that, but, but there's this sense of, we've got to choose white sides here. Like this, the Mexican American war was really easy because we could racialize that thing. Yeah. And the Spanish American war, we could say that Spaniards are themselves kind of the trash of Europe. They're not like us. Right. Uh, they're more like Italians. Oh no, this was, this was our, this Northern European kind of prejudice that, that we exuded. And so now world war one, holy shit. Like these are proper white people that we got to fight. Okay, and then they even had to get a committee. How do we demonize them? Because we can't say they're racially inferior. Yeah. And, and so, you know, post-war, no, you don't, get, you don't get a ton of all of a sudden Nazis in the 1920s. You do get all these Klansmen who are, who are they're shook, right? After this war, seeing how things can fall apart, how ideology can separate you, uh, how, how science may be bad. They're in social chaos and they're scared shitless. You know, I think that a great book on white America should just be called Scared Shitless. <laughs> and, and so you have a, a look, returning to order, Christian patriotic order, just like they remember it when it never existed before like that. And yes, the Klan, just like El Monte, nationally, the Klan eats itself. And then in the night, but but they make a couple really, really solid inroads politically. And with the ideology of, of white scientific racists in academia, plus your working class to middle class uh, white knights of the Ku Klux Klan, were able to forge in the 1920s a immigration law that essentially says, anyone but Northern Europeans are not allowed in this country any longer. And the reason why is because they will poison our blood. Like they are an inferior group of people. Everyone else, except this little key here, right? Back to Helm's Deep, right. except the keep. Uh, everyone else is dangerous. And you know, this racial law in 1924, the uh, National Origins Act has a profound effect on American history. It makes America artificially white from 1924 to artificially white in some ways, 1924 to the 1960s. And you hear that, you always hear like white conservatives like, oh, it was Vietnam that changed it in the hippies. Bullshit. It was Brown versus Board, uh, anti-integration, <laughs> yeah. anti anti-segregation, and the then the inclusion of the Chinese, India's Indians from India, yeah. these uh, Africans, all of these different groups of people that now can come to the United States, and that's what makes it not so great. These are the exact fears that these Nazis in the 1960s and 70s in El Monte. I mean, they're a funny fucking group. Because what, what happened in that fucking house is oh, man, it's insane, right? You can make a you can make like a fucked up dark comedy about it, you know. <laughs> like, in fact, uh, in in my, I have a class. Uh, I, I have I teach a California history class, and I don't have students write academic papers. I have them write uh, historical fiction instead. <laughs> That's awesome. And so they have to they have to do the exact same level of research, but they are not tied down by, according to so and so so and so. And academic papers are so constipated. You just there yeah. is they're as painful to read as they are to write. They're they're horrible to write. Yeah. <laughs> and it's painful. It's painful. Fiction, historical fiction gets really interesting. And you have to really research something to write fiction about it. And somebody wrote did a, actually a comic book about <laughs> about the El Monte Nazi house. I had this you... kid in my class who was so into anime and manga and asked me asked me if, if she could do a comic book instead. And I saw that she was a really good artist. And I'm like, she could publish do. that thing. It's, if you didn't know the context of it, you would think it never there's happened. something terribly wrong here. But right. it, was, it was a really great idea. Um, if placed in the right context, because it's 
how do you exist in a world where you are so beyond the pale, you're so beyond normal, you live in this fa this fantasy land, you live in a fucking house with swastikas all over it, right? It you kind of reminded me of American History X, where they go to that, yeah. they have that one barn, right, where all, you know everybody's in there, and they're just partying and shit, and it's fucking wild in there. Right, and it's it's almost like they took the barn, and they put the, the walls out, so yeah. you could see all, all of the Nazi uh, and anybody who right? anybody watching listening to this like you gotta i mean look at the, the the photo of that house and i had seen that a photo of that house years back but i didn't know you know the context i mean it's just this house in 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 el monte where it's uh it has kkk all over it swastikas like just on a corner and this is what in the 60s <laughs> yeah 60s and 70s there you are walking your dog La, da, 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 da. Oh, I like what they did with their yard. Holy shit, what's that? Yeah. It's a mammoth. So and then and then they start gunning for each other. Yeah. But a lot of it was that it was back to this what will maybe happen with the our friends, the Proud Boys, uh, is that they will see disloyalty. And your ideology is so ingrained, it is so in stone that somebody who has a slightly different, like I like to wear my swastikas on the left armband. Like, <laughs> right. What? Well, that's what I was saying. Like if your MO is us versus them, them starts changing that your, your, your definition of them changes. And sooner or later, like you're saying now, then you're just in a bunker by yourself with your wife and your dog and your doctor. And that's it, you know, cause right. them it, is everybody else now. But there's, there's always, and we're seeing, we are, absolutely seeing this with the proud boys the proud boys come to portland and we were thinking all of us the proud boys are going to come to portland there's going to be a blm uh protest a couple blocks away shit's going down right and then it didn't because the proud boys okay it was much smaller than they thought it was going to be but the proud boys are doing the exact same thing that the clan and and the nazis in america did which is okay, we've got to kind of lose this super radical guys with guns who are just going to come kill you. Let's all get together and say prayers. Let's all get together and make it seem normal. We're just normal bearded guys with sleeve tattoos with some interesting artwork uh, who just love Jesus. And we love America. What's wrong with that? How can you fault that? What, do you hate America and you hate Jesus? Yeah. And I'm like, dude, okay, but it's this, it's this, this quest to normalize, but within that quest to normalize, you are going to alienate the hardcore group. Right. Like, no, we're here on a mission. White people are being exterminated. There's a war against Christians. There's in all of that kind of rhetoric that you hear over and over again, this, again, scared shitless, right? Right. Um, America, scared shitless. And they will turn on each other. But the, the scary thing is, that the hardcore guys are probably going to go away and form a new group. The ones who are accommodating, they're going to join a political party and they will disavow the violence and they say, no, 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 that's just all bad press. Yeah, I was a proud boy, but only because I was proud of my country. Can you right. fault me for that? Yeah. And and we'll we'll see this. So what you what you end up having is a fairly radical group take over uh, what otherwise would be, in some ways, a reasonable political party. I'm not saying it's happening right now, or has happened, or yeah, I am. Well, yeah, yeah, I mean, I yeah. I was going to say. I mean, this is what we've what we've seen in the last 30 years in America, and the takeover of the Republican Party. The fact that there's this fucking Lincoln movement. Oh my, a Lincoln project. Get out! John Bolton is a is against the Republican Party. This is topsy turvy world. This yeah. shows that we are we are in a new world. We have never seen anything like it. And with that, I mean, that that means we got to keep our our fucking what's that line from uh, Anchorman? We got to keep our head on a swivel because <laughs> there's some shit. You know, there's some shit going down, right? When when everything is collapsing and we kind of need it to collapse, right? Cause it was the shit that was built was so fucked up, but it's, it's, you know, we're, we're trying to have things collapse a little so that we can rebuild it better, but it's a fucking vulnerable time, man. It's a vulnerable no, yeah. time. 
we're playing it like drunk Jenga. Yeah. Do a, I'm just going to take this one. Gosh, you know, uh, that, with no sense of history, with no sense of the future of, you know, really what no sense of history, right? Like you don't, a lot of people don't know what's happened. You know, what, you know, why are, they're pulling at Jenga logs, not knowing how they were put placed there and to begin with and what they're attached to. Yeah, and, and, and with, with Jenga, you know it's going to come down sooner or later, but you want to limit the destruction. Right. And so what we, what we really, what we need to do is limit the destruction. We can't just, we can't just stand by and let it collapse. Right. I mean, we'd be dancing on rubble. Social suicide. I mean, this, this, yeah, yeah. And, and like, this is how we become Somalia. Yeah. You know, and which. Or just, you know, I'm from, my mom's from Honduras or just Honduras, you know, or, you know, and what happened to Honduras was, you know, let me defend it a little bit. That, that was external pressures. Let's say that, but the same result, right? You just start eating yourself, you know, you start, you know, devolving into chaos into to being ruled by little mafia, fascism, fascism, ruled yeah, by no, no, little no, mafias. Right. As we are ruled by corrupt little bosses. Yeah. Uh, who play into these intense emotions and how successful. I, mean, I uh, personally, I never, I, I was rooting. It's so funny. In 2015, I would look at the polls every day, praying that Donald Trump would beat Ted Cruz uh, for the presidential nomination. Yeah. Because in my heart and mind, I thought there is not a chance in hell that this guy could ever get elected. I didn't think that either. And in, until the summer of 2016, when I predicted it in July, and I was like, oh, this guy's going to win. Oh, I, I was, I, I will never forget the night I was at a, I was at a colleague's house and every, every four years we would go for the election, whatever election it was. And so we'd been through two Obama elections. And so we felt like we're on a streak, right? Like this is where the nation needs to be. And now that's the next step. Uh, I don't love the candidate, but I will sure like the candidate more than like the apocalypse that they're running against. Right. And then when, when everyone, when the report started coming in, I, I, I left this party. It was seven o'clock and I went to bed immediately and I slept, I think, <laughs> for 15 hours. Having you sent yourself nightmares. to your room. <laughs> I sent myself to my, I could not believe it. And then coming to work the next day and we teach at a, a mostly Latino university. And if there's not, I mean, I don't have a class I don't have a class that isn't dominated by the sons and daughters of immigrants. Wow. And, and there were, I mean, there were people. Fresno's who in were, the central Valley, right? I mean, that's. Yeah. We, we, this is, this is us. They were, I mean, they were just sobbing. I, I, I'd never seen, uh, I, I was teaching through nine 11 at a white school and they got angry and there was a bunch of that, but this, there were just there were just people like where do we go now? What do right. we do? They were they were afraid and they had they had good cause. And it's even because, worse now. I mean now now we've we've seen the beast. We've been able to see what he's he's about, what who he's with, who supports him for the past four years. So if he wins again, which I have a I have a huge fear that he will win again. Um, yeah, then yeah. people like me, Latinos and black people and everybody you know, gays, everybody. Oh, America doesn't want us. This country that we love doesn't love us. And it's clear they took a vote and they have voted. If he wins again, isn't that over? Isn't, isn't America over for a while? <laughs> well, I, I don't know. My, you know, my greater fears are what institutionally, what will Ooh. happen to the entire, the entire, back to Jenga, the, the entire structure. Like what else are we going to destroy? We did the, we did a great job on the CDC. We're doing a terrific job on the EPA, the FBI. That shit's going south. Not that they've ever been the greatest guys in the world. He's gonna have but, three just. He's gonna have three justices on the Supreme Court. Right, and, and <laughs> Trump justices. <laughs> so it's what it will do to the entire structure of the country. At some point, demographically, that cannot hold no like nebraska ain't nebraska no more 
Yeah. You know, Kansas is no longer just Kansas. Like, once you decide to open up that poultry plant and then all those people around there, they decide they would only work for 15 bucks an hour. But then you found this group that would work for nine. Yeah. You've just changed the, demo the demographic profile of your town. Yeah. And it's going to stick. And then you're going to freak your shit out. You're going to try to, even though you invited this, you're now going to try to stop it. Well, it won't stop because this is the way cultures move. They're not invading. They were invited. Yeah. And now you're going to disinvite them because you, you don't like the fact that you just drove by a sign in Spanish. <sighs> oh man. I, and I was worried that we wouldn't be able to, to, to go that the distance, but I also knew that we would because, uh, I mean, um, man, you know, I mean, you, you kind of, you, you, you just knowing what you know about California and, 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 and racism, I mean, you study it on the microcosm and that's, you know, El, El, Mo El Monte, California, whatever Republicans want to think, California is America, you know? And yeah. if you can understand what happens there, you can, you pretty much know what happens every what's happening everywhere else. You know? El, El Monte is a, a perfect example of, of, of it's the bellwether of America. You are going to see this and borders. They're not going to mean much. I know. And the more hostility you show towards a group, uh, essentially the more corrupt you're going to be. Like you go to Idaho <laughs> and listen to the shit they're talking up there. Yeah. Uh, it, this, this is, this doesn't end. It, it doesn't, it ends in two ways. It either doesn't end well, or it ends in essentially, it, it's not a takeover. The true pluralistic society we're supposed to be. It's you the know, evolution of America. Right. I mean, it'll make us better. You know, it'll make us stronger. It'll make us what I thought we always wanted to be cosmopolitan and multi multicultural. Right. And, and that's that's Paris and London and Los Angeles and New York and Chicago that you walk through there. There are it just it, 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 there are shops of people. There is there's a. There's a Eritrean shop right next to the Ethiopian one. You yeah. have these places with that are civil wars with each other or, or border conflicts, and there they are with, in, with their own Mon Pa shops on the exact same street, and they're not fighting each other. Yeah, like this is the kind of pluralism that it's supposed to be. You know, you'll go if I go to the mountains, and it just if I go to some place that is just one particular community, and that is it. And I return back to L.A. and walking through downtown L.A., I really think, yeah, this is the way we're supposed to be. It's not dangerous. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 and I always, you know, do the thought experiment. Imagine America without black people, without Latinos, without Asians. Like, I mean, just the food, the culture, Dude, the music, how much, everything. How much Chick-fil-A can you eat? Yeah, you know. Really? NASCAR would be the only sport in town, right? Yeah, I mean, and it, again, I'm not saying, you know, you know, there's people who think, again, hatred is, is a disease, man, you know, and there's people who think, who, who are Latino and black, who think we need to get rid of white people. But like, again, think of America without white people, you know? Some people are like, yeah, I, I wish I can easily imagine that. But no, no, I, you know, it's Jenga. Every piece is essential. Every yeah. piece is essential. Well, yeah, and, you know, the... The answer to white supremacy is not a different color of supremacy. Right. That's that's yeah. important. I mean, and, and that's controversial, right? Because people say, oh, you can't talk about the threat of Latino supremacy or the threat of black supremacy because it's never happened and it'll, it'll never happen. But that that's that's a non sequitur. That it never happened doesn't mean that it can't happen. Uh, or that right, it's it, that it's not a feature of blackness, or if it's not a feature of Latinoness, it's, we're humans. White these racist white people are human beings. Their whiteness does not make them racist. Their actually their humanness, <laughs> something in their in the the human character, you know, pride and and tribalism and fear, scared shitless. Scared we're just fucking shitless. chimps. <laughs> we're chimps and we're afraid. <laughs> and we have, you know, like Christopher Hitchens says, you know, we have. Our adrenaline glands are too big, and our you know, and our index thumb juxtaposition isn't what it should be, and that's pretty much it. 
you know? Yeah, no, we're, we're, yeah, we're chimps who brush our teeth and comb our hair. Yeah. Well, I just told my brother that today brother. when he needed a, a pep talk. But <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Hey, let people know where they can find you on social media or, you know, oh, yeah, maybe well, if you don't want people to find you after this talk. <laughs> you know, I, I've, been, I, I've been chased down before. Um, oh, really? Uh, and it's no fun. Oh. Yeah, I was, uh, I was followed by, um, by the right wing students of, uh, of our university for a while. Oh, fun. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was a, that was quite fun. Quite fun. Um, I'm really not on social media. Uh, anyone you, who ever wants to talk to me about, and as, as you'll see, I will pretty much talk about anything uh, to anyone at any time. And even if you were, uh, if, if I had gotten the Zoom call from, you know, guy, Der Fuhr, 666, something like that, I probably would have done the, <laughs> the, the, the same thing with him. Um, but do you do, do you do that? Do you, do you talk to Nazis? Do you talk to Ku Klux Klan? Like that one black guy who's converted over 200 KKK members. He's a black jazz player. I, I, will, t- I, I will talk to anyone who, who wants to talk uh, seriously and authentically. Right. I will talk to anyone. Right. If, the same way. If, if it's, if it's intended to uh, trap you uh, and destroy your life, which is the, the MO for, a lot of groups these days, yeah. you know, get them to say something and even if out of context, in context, whatever, doesn't matter, make that clip go right. and then hope they get death threats. Yeah. Which they will. <laughs> Jesus Christ. And, and that, no, I don't want to engage in that. Like power, t- I, I, I've had right wing radio stations ask me to come on. Uh, and I, I would have, but I looked into the way that they were operating the, the interview and I'm not going to do that. I, I've had I've had a politician on or two, and I don't think I'm going to do that again either because I don't want I don't want to bring you on just so you can go through your script. I'm, I I have genuine questions, and I want to talk to you human to human. But some people, politician, whatever their job is, whatever their mo is, they don't show you. They don't. They're not interested in authentic, honest conversation. Right. They're they're self interested. Right. And but, that's that's all this all the interview is is them pushing that thing that benefits them somehow, whether it's financial or emotionally, uh, in some way they get a benefit. And yeah, I, and to me, my benefit is I love to gab and talk. Yeah. I'm a shit talker, like yeah. nobody's business. And then I will definitely back, have you back on the show because I'm the same way. And then don't you find that people like, people don't like to have, like, are you the bane of your friendship's existence? Like, People are like, why? Why do you always want to talk about stuff? Like, uh, and I'm like, what do you mean? What What do you mean? Why Why don't you not want to talk about stuff? Yes, in my family, in my family, this is true. Yeah, uh, in my family and my in laws, yeah, I'm I'm that guy. In my uh, academic world, where all of my friends are, because I essentially live on an island in Fresno <laughs> uh, of ac- academics. No, we're we're all pretty much like that. Though they do say, Dan, just shut. Every now and then, you just have to shut up, and they're right. But, <laughs> they're definitely right. But it's you know, it, it, some, I, I shut up for a while, but then I, I find myself not as happy as when I'm talking. <laughs> when you know, when I'm thinking, when I'm learning something new, when I'm you know, engaging my fucking brain, which right. you get so few opportunities to do in the normal world. Right, and this is what I'd say if there if there are right wing people, white Nazis, and all these. If there's anyone listening or watching, this isn't about propaganda this is about processing yeah but now when when we're talking and i i really think that this was our experience and genuinely that you know we came in and saw where a conversation would take us right and there was no there were no not i didn't have anything written down that i was going to say you know there are maybe some questions i got, just a, few, in, I got a few facts right, but that's just, it. Just i didn't even look case, at them <laughs> right because because when it's not gelling you've got you've got you got to light it somehow, right? You yeah, got to get yeah. this thing moving. But, but a lot of people don't know how to do that. A lot of people, most people don't know how to do that, I would say. Yeah. And so, and so what we're, what we're doing is we're just a couple guys who, you know, fancy ourselves fairly bright, who are processing things having to do with the most serious discussions in this country. And if that's, I mean, and if that's a waste of time, then I'd happily waste my time for the rest of my life. But uh, right, and and it's ta- and what we're doing is taboo. Uh, that that doesn't bother me at all. I mean, because if we, if we go by what's taboo, again, our, our puritan puritanical founding, like they're trying to make everything taboo. Right. They're trying to make everything taboo. Well, and they're trying to pretend that that was the founding. 
You yeah. know, it's like, this is back to American history. Yeah. Like, of course we were the city on the hill. Of course there's a covenant with God. I know it, it's, it's a great rationalization for your like horrible policies towards human beings. Yeah. Um, you know, 1619 project uh, and losing their shit. Yeah, I mean, Oy. not wanting to know, just just know where, 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 you know, you love this country. And I say this all the time. They claim to be patriots, right? Republicans claim, I'll say Republicans, but certain Republicans claim to be patriots. They fly these big ass flags. No, I'm a patriot. I, I challenge them. I'm more of a patriot than they are because I want to know about this country, everything. The things that I don't want to know about, I want to know about, right? Right. And they just want to know a certain side of it. That isn't loving your country. That no, isn't loving, loving your, your wife. It's if you don't loving only... your sports team. Right. But the thing is, is, they know more about their sports team than they do about their country. They right. don't know the history of the country. They do this in the same way. It, I've always kind of likened it to really bad internet dating. Is that, oh, I found this great profile. I am in love. I'm in <laughs> love with this person. Their profile is everything that I want. Well, do you want to know about their, their, their past? Not if they're not willing to tell me. Right. I will accept anything they tell me about their past is true. Okay, you sure about that? Absolutely. Yeah. And then uh, I have some bad news for you. I just looked into this actual person. Uh, that is not a 22-year-old from Miami Beach. It's actually a 47-year-old from Uzbekistan. <laughs> and, um, yeah. even, and in a prison in Uzbekistan for, you know, got some horrible crime. No, absolutely not. I don't believe it. But And I know, I people, I know people like that with their friends, with their with their spouses who they don't dig in they don't say well, you know tell me tell me i don't know this story about you tell me about that they don't do that they don't ask what well, you know what's for dinner that's it what's for and dinner what what's and if it's like but there's the other there's the other thing if you discover something about your spouse about your friend that is so heinous you might have to cancel that relationship you mm. might have to cut it off that is a risk that you take yeah but what you're going to find most of the time, I imagine, is a human being that did, uh, that was absolutely imperfect, uh, that had some really bad moments. Had some as we all moments, are, as we all and, do, and, right? And, and and yes, in our and we, I don't expect them to have to relive that trauma. Telling me, yeah, uh, about that, they can keep. There are things you can always keep to yourself. Right. But in this. In, in American history, we need to know about those traumas because that's what makes us, I mean, that is the path that leads us here. Right. And when we say that we got beamed down from, from you know, un, brought down by unicorns, yeah. um, we, can't, we simply can't engage in that fantasy. And right-wing patriots need to accept the fact that historians for the, for, maybe not the last couple hundred years, but certainly for the last 40 years, have really dug into the details of the history of this country. And it's not as if we were finding like, oh, here are 1,800 examples of this thing, and then one counterexample. Ooh, I'm gonna use that counterexample and say that that's the pattern. We don't do that. We actually look at the things that have affected affected ghettoization, right? In fact, why is it that why is it that these people in Chicago think that this idea of an ethnic enclave that is that much poorer than the group across the street is a natural thing? Right. No, we need to know, but like, if you never heard about redlining, right. it would just seem like, oh, this is the natural consequence of people being lazy. Yeah. But then you, or, but I would also say, and I, I know you got to wrap up, but one of the most important laws that we ever had on the books was the anti-miscegenation laws. Which were, they just got rid of those relatively recently, right? Well, in California, it was written in 1851, the exact same time when you were getting real value out of California. So you're getting, I mean, it, 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 the gold is real and there was a lot of it, but it was placed into the hands of only one group. And the other groups were not allowed to have it. What groups were that? The only because the Californios, the the Californios were, they were the cream of the crop before white people came, right? Yeah, they they believed themselves to be. I mean, they were <laughs> okay. they were also they were also living in a, a, a utter fantasy world. Okay, um, as every, as everybody at the top of their situation and, tends and, to. And part of that fantasy was we are so white, we are so white. When these white people come, they will accept us as white. Oh yeah. 
uh, yeah, welcome, welcome to the real world, friend. And and so then you dispossess th them of their land, not by stealing it, but by creating laws that make it so they cannot continue to defend it. And this anti-miscegenation laws, if now you have guys with bank accounts, but non-whites can never marry into that thing. And so it has to go multi-generational and it stays in the hands. This is till 1948 in, in Los Angeles, in Cal California. And so not only do you have redlining and not only have housing covenants, not only have all of these de facto and de jure, de jure uh, elements here that are concentrating wealth, you have it so couples, like you're not allowed to essentially fall in love, right? You're yeah. not allowed to have this romantic relationship that you just would think would be a basic human right. Uh, unless you, if you do, you are going to have to move someplace else and you don't get to keep your money. So the money state, I mean, there's a reason why these areas are still these areas. And multi-generational well, multi multi poverty. People who don't, aren't, don't know much about history, aren't used to reading history, uh, they think 1948, that's a long time ago. Things have changed radically since then. It's been such a long time. But the more you, you know this, more than I do, the more you read history, the more you know that 1948 is fucking yesterday. You yeah, know? and, and, and th then think of in the 1920s, the NAACP in Los Angeles fought to get uh, black ownership in white neighborhoods, in residential neighborhoods. The course, court, it goes to the California Supreme Court. And the court determines that yes, black people can buy houses in white neighborhoods. So NAACP is like, finally, finally. Second part of the judgment, they can buy, but they cannot occupy. You can <laughs> buy the house in the white neighborhood, but you are not allowed to move in. So what year I mean, is that? What year is that? This is this. Uh, I think if, if anybody's listening to this and they would probably jot it down, I'm gonna I'm gonna ballpark it at about 1921. Wow. So, I mean, and that's crazy. I mean, that's that's people's grandparents, great grandparents who were around that time. Right. And but then you would have someone say in one of these debates that's inauthentic, they would say, "Well, I have I happen to have the law here that show it shows that the NAACP fought and successfully made it so African Americans could buy in white residential neighborhoods." Boom. End of story. And you'd be like, okay, where's my fact checker? Oh shit, what am I going to do? Yeah. No, that that's the abuse. <laughs> so then the abuse of history. The abuse of the abuse of history. I like that. So yeah, now you have two titles. You, you we started this conversation with saying you had trouble with titles. The abuse of history is, is has to be the title of an upcoming book by you. And America, you know, uh, scared shitless. <laughs> Th those are the two titles. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. But thank you okay. so much. All for right. coming on uh it's been a real pleasure i'll, I'll bring you back on whenever uh, i mean there's this is never this is not going away any time in our lifetime so uh, i'm not gonna be leaving my house anytime <laughs> soon so i'm always here and after uh, this i might not be able to leave my house because the trucks may be coming for me yeah well i mean i, I try to keep my location you know yeah. very uh vague but uh thanks for coming on um all right. the the audio will be up later today and the video will be up on youtube i'll send you the links and all that stuff Okay. Cheers. Have a good weekend. Cheers. You too.